This is the Sony Ericsson Live View, the first smartwatch. Released in 2010. Wait, what? Whoa, what's that? Well, I'm going to try out using some animated graphics in this video, so let's see how it goes. Anyway, this predates being advertised as a smartwatch. Its direct successor was actually named the Sony Smartwatch. Its original cost was $75. It features a 1.3 inch 128 by 128 OLED display, has an 80 milliamp hour battery with 96 hours of runtime, is compatible with Android 2 or greater, and uses Bluetooth 2.1. Now let me stop you before you start furiously writing a comment to tell me about the Pulsar, the data bank, the watch pad, or Microsoft Spot. When I say this is the first smartwatch, by that I mean this is the first watch made to relay information from your phone. The previous devices either lacked connectivity, were their own awkward standalone OS, or in the case of Spot, received one-way impersonal information that doesn't work anymore because the service is shut down. So this was the first device to do what we now expect from smartwatches. Now in the box you get the live view, the manual, the legalese booklet, a clip, and a standard 22mm watch band. I particularly like the clip. It's one of those ideas that sounds good on paper, but doesn't translate well to actual usage. So you will just use your watch as a paper clip? Oh, this is a great use. This way you can't see it at all, but everyone else can. But still, I'm glad it's included. The watch band is also... interesting. The watch has a micro USB port on the bottom for charging. It's protected by a small rubber plug, seemingly making it water resistant, but the legalese booklet promptly states not to get it wet at all. Now again, this port is on the bottom, not the side. And when you put it into the watch band, the pin for the watch strap actually blocks the port. So every time you want to charge the watch, which is every day, you must remove it from the watch band and plug it in. Not only is this tediously annoying, but since it's just snapped in place, the fit becomes quite loose over time. The way you use the device is probably not what you would expect. It has two buttons, one for selecting and one for power, and I can tell you it is oh so convenient to have the power button proudly exposed on the corner of the device. Yeah, I didn't accidentally bump that all day. But those buttons are typical. What is strange is that this is not a touchscreen device. Instead, it has capacitive buttons under the four sides of the display. This was an odd choice, even in 2010. Now, I have a small confession. Even though I just unboxed this, this live view isn't actually new. This is the fourth live view I've owned, and I actually had to get this one from Draga1 after determining all three of my original live views no longer worked. This one perished to moisture after having battery issues. This one is MIA due to a weak band connection. This one had boot loop issues. And finally, I have one that works for this video. Now, even this one isn't perfect, and we'll see more about that later. I really like this device, but it just isn't reliable. They had so many problems, and some of them, like my last one, are seemingly alright, but just don't work anymore. I purchased this one, my first live view, around 2011 to use with my Xperia Play, a phone I'll probably cover in a separate video. It isn't doing so great anymore, but it gives us a good look at what's inside. I detached the battery previously, but it goes about here on the PCB. 80 milliamp hours is about all they could fit in here with this type of cell. Modern smartwatches are much more compactly designed and pack a bigger battery and less space. Not mentioned in any of the marketing is a rumble motor, which is what's actually used to notify you to look at your watch. And lastly, of the more significant parts, we can see the Bluetooth antenna in the PCB, which really wasn't enough. When I originally got this watch to use with my phone, both devices being Sony was just a coincidence. It was common, though, for Sony to release exclusive accessories that only worked with their phones. However, the Live View is compatible with any suitable Android phone, and today I'll be using it with my Nexus 6P. You can force the Live View into pair mode if it's already paired by continuing to hold down the power button when it is turning on, which is one of at least two undocumented features that this has. The other being entering firmware programming mode by holding the select button at startup. But I want to demonstrate one of the first flaws with the Live View you will encounter, so I'm going to start it up without it being able to connect to my phone. With it paired, if you start it without it being able to connect, you will see this. No time, no menus, no options, nothing. The Live View alone is useless and able to do quite literally nothing. 
This has to do with how it works for the most part, which we'll get into later. Once it's connected, we get a time and can start to use it. The first thing you will encounter is being unable to open any apps. And that's how it's meant to work. It doesn't just let you browse your data. It's only capable of showing you your current notifications. If you don't have any pending notifications, there's nothing to see. There isn't even a settings area for you to do something as basic as change the brightness. So let's try sending myself an email. No, that doesn't work. Ah, text message. Nope. Okay, let's go in the app and enable Twitter. Oh, the Twitter service is gone. Okay, let's scrape the bottom of the barrel with Facebook. That seems pretty broken as well. So, yeah, almost all of the services for the Live View no longer work. Calendar events are still functional, and so are phone calls, but that's it. The watch never supported Gmail, so email doesn't work either, which was a big problem when it was new. And Google has been having some serious ADHD when it comes to the SMS apps, so any APIs this was using have long since been forgotten. The Live View is never designed to show general notifications, so what works now is all you get. As far as being a watch, the Live View is limited by its selection of watch faces. Or should I say, its watch face. There is a workaround way you could get more watch faces, but it's not the same thing. I'll touch more on that in a bit. So if you don't like the look of this one, then you're pretty much out of luck. Also, the screen shuts off automatically, because it would deplete that 80 mAh battery very quickly if it were on all the time, and you must push the button to see the time. There is no tilt to wake, so the Live View must be operated with two hands, even to do something as simple as check the time. So its notification and timekeeping functionality is lacking, but it has other features that easily redeem this device. It can be used to control media playback by holding down the select button in the main menu. I used this feature a lot to easily control the music when I couldn't reach my phone. But the most important feature this has is plugins. The Live View was rather quickly forgotten by Sony, and it never really got any updates. It was replaced in 2012 by the Sony Smartwatch, which had similar hardware to the Live View, but was completely software incompatible. But third-party developers loved the Live View. This gave the Live View a lot more usability, and there was a point where you could always find something new to try on it. Taking pictures from it, a proper calendar, and even a way of seeing your phone's screen were plugins I remember using on it and thinking it was really cool. But one of the things that always seemed like a shame to me was the lack of time-wasting or entertainment software. Specifically, games. There was one for it, but that was it. So I took it upon myself to write a game for it, so I cloned 2048. Here you can see the problem that this live view has. The bottom of the screen has began to darken and discolor. This was a perfect fit for the Live View because it's actually terrible at sending and receiving data. 2048 only needs to update after the user gives input. Let's go back to that camera app. If we try to actually use it, you'll see that it is extremely unstable. This is because the Live View has an infamously bad Bluetooth connection, and it is awful when it comes to repeatedly updating the display. You would expect the camera app to be constantly receiving data from the phone, but every app worked that way including something as simple as the watch face plugins. All plugins run on the phone only. The only thing that ever gets sent to the watch is image data, which is why you can't change the watch face. The built-in one is hard programmed in and not replaceable. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the only thing that actually runs on the live view, including the menu. So what happens when an app wants to update information on the display? Well, there are two ways it could be programmed to do it. The easier way was just to send a bunch of sprites to the screen one at a time and have the image built on the watch. But this would create a lot of Bluetooth traffic and was very unstable. Additionally, you would end up writing extra data that you would cover up with future sprites. The better way to do it was to build the entire screen image on the phone and send only one longer communication. This was significantly more reliable and is how I made my 2048 clone. 
My code is released as open source, so if you want to check it out, I've linked it in the description. Overall, it was a really fun project to program for a device that was somewhat handicapped like that, and made for an interesting challenge. The code's not the best, so if you do look into it, don't be surprised to see some sloppy areas. This was just a fun little experiment. Now there was one more application that was significant for LiveView users. Open LiveView. This was an open source implementation of the LiveView control app that runs on your phone. It takes over the menu, the watch, notifications, media control, almost everything. It is considerably more stable than the original app, so it was a great way to make your LiveView a better device. Except for one problem. It never got to the point where you could run plugins on it. So if you wanted to take advantage of the assortment of interesting things you could do with the watch, you still had to run the Sony program. Now in 2018, the LiveView is in its twilight years. If you can find a working example of the hardware, you can still make it work. But Google is planning some changes to the Play Store that may result in the culling of older applications. You could still sideload the APKs if you can find them, of course, but if they won't let you download them, there's no guarantee they will still work in newer versions of Android. Some time ago, Sony closed down the Ericsson website as a whole, and that took down the original info about the watch as well as access to the SDK for making new plugins. There are some copies of it out there, but they aren't easy to find. This is probably my last chance to use a live view. I will be archiving all the APKs I have to use with older phones, but there's no telling how long this final live view device will hold up. If the other three I have are any indication, this one's days are numbered. Despite all of its drawbacks from poor notifications, bad Bluetooth connectivity, mixed plug-in quality, I remember it fondly from when I used it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I will miss it when it's gone. It was a fun, simple device. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this look at this device and my perspective of it from a more technical developer side. I may try to do something more with this in the future while it still works, but that will really depend on how long it lasts. But for now, I'll see you later.